Thank you. All right. All right. So tonight's lecture is on on uh, we're going to talk about the methods one may use or a teacher may use to help you improve versus what the technical content is or what technique is and how the two mesh together. And uh, this stems out of some people were taking uh, some training with JFOU at Mount St. Anne. JF is a wonderful uh, teacher and he's a beautiful skier. And uh, I know he's helped many people improve their skiing. Now, uh, out of those, out of that learning session, there, there was uh, a feeling of a little bit of frustration. Frustration is part of learning. You know, I'm I'm personally learning how to play squash uh, with my left hand. I'm I'm totally right-handed, and I hurt hurt my tendon in my right arm, and I can't hit the ball with my right hand. So I'm learning, and it's, it, it, there's moments where it's frustration where I know what I'm supposed to be doing, but my mind and my muscles don't react the way that I think they should react, and then and I then I get frustrated about it. Um, there there's kind of four stages to learning. Uh, you know, four, four basics. <laughs> um, and let's see if I can remember them. One, one is uh, frustration, uh, um, simplification, or sorry, the, fir the first stage is confusion, right? So in, in the learning, uh, we're, we're confused about what we're learning. And this is what I want to talk about you know, methods versus technique. So that's the first step in learning is there's a lot of confusion. And, and when there's confusion in our minds, we end up being quite frustrated about that. And, and the reason I'm talking to you is to understand that this, these are natural things that happen in the learning process. And if you, if you understand them, then we can deal with those learning processes. It's, ne it's never easy. If it was easy, we'd call it snowboarding. And that, that's the humor and joke of the night, okay? So um, confusion, and, and that's a process that we have to go through before we actually understand it. But confusion leads to frustration. And, and there are those frustration moments, but we are, are in control of that, that emotion. And if we can take a couple of deep breaths, and if we understand that that's a place in time, in learning, that, we'll, that we will take some time to go through. And it may be a short moment with, with one thing, but it may be a longer process on my way to my level two or on my way to my level three. When you come out of that frustration level, the confusion frustration level, the first thing that happens is, is that things become simplified. And this is that next step, simplification. And when you really understand something, it's very simple. And there was uh, a famous person said, if you, if you can't say something simply, you just don't understand it, right? And so when you find a good teacher, often they will say things simply that will help you understand it, although with, with many different components to it, maybe frustration. But simplification is the next step, and that leads to understanding. So those are, those are kind of the, the four phases. Uh, confusion, frustration, simplification, understanding. And uh, yes, Lynn to everybody. Thanks. You've, you've got it up there. It's good, good job. And, and if, if you know it, and, and it can be, uh, if, if you look at ski teaching or ski technique, it can apply to the whole sphere, or it can apply to one segment. It can be to the technique section segment of level one or level two. It can be the teaching segment of the level three, or it can be the TD. And, and you'll go through these things. And sometimes it's a, it's a cycle. Uh, and it may be a small thing as understanding what rotary movements are and how they apply in moguls versus short turns versus long turns. And, and understand that you can go through these things, but try to, try to relax, try to enjoy that that frustrating moment. I know that in, in squash, sure, I get emotional sometimes and I'm frustrated that the learning isn't going as fast as I want. But then I think about how other people in the world are in in some some situations that are truly frustrating, like our friends in 
in, in Ukraine there. And their life is frustrating. And um, our life, our life when we're worried about skiing is not that frustrating when you really think of it in context of, of those things. Um, so uh, one of the things that can lead to that, that confusion and that frustration is how different teachers approach the learning cycle. And uh, in my title for this talk, I talk about uh, methodology or the method in which you will bring a learner, and this is from a teacher's perspective, the method that you use to bring a learner from one stage or one level of ability to the next level where, the, where they learn. And the more you've been teaching and the longer you, and the more you know a subject, the more diverse your methods may be because you've learned from a, a, lot, a lot of the method or that process of method comes from experience and and a method a method is like a, a pathway if you're going from point a to point b you don't have to take the shortest route off and you can take many different pathways uh, to get from point a to point b it might be a highway it might be a train it might be an airplane it might be walking it might be running it might be skipping it might be crawling it might be through a submarine or a ship or whatever and, and that's just a this is me, a, a, a metaphor to show that i can go from a to b but the method is the choice of the teacher. But what the teacher doesn't have a choice on in terms of skiing is technique. The, the, the methods are, are underscored in technique. So technique are the tools, right? Uh, or, or the movement patterns uh, based on science. So in our case, science is, is gravity. It's the friction of air friction and snow and it's how a ski reacts. It's the biomechanics of the body and how our bodies work. But the hardest part of teaching is how I communicate with somebody. Each individual, I have to communicate with them um, in a way that they can conceptualize what I'm trying to get them to do in terms of a movement. And that movement, that movement pattern, if I, if I say it to one person one way, if I say, turn your foot, somebody will, will physically try to turn your foot. And that's actually impossible. And we use that because there's a lot of feelings in there, but the leg turns, right? And somebody else might say, turn the ski. And somebody else might say, it's like the wheels of a car, turn, turn the bottom. And, and these are all different methods of, of trying to get your student to do really the same thing. In the same way, and um, we can we we know there's many different uh, different ways to do that. And because a teacher talks about one way, that doesn't mean it's technique. What what is this, the underlying technique? Is we know we know we have to turn with the lower body, right? Uh, and that's a rotary movement. We, we know that we have to pressure the ski in the middle, but that we have to use all joints. Sometimes we pressure a little bit forward, sometimes we pressure a little bit back. But I may say, I, to get some pressure on the outside ski, I may say, lift my inside hand up, lower your outside hand. That's a method to get the weight on the outside ski. That's not technique. Another way might be, you know, just stand on the outside ski, lift, lift your inside foot off. But somebody else may say, take the, take the weight off the inside ski so there's pressure on the outside ski. These are all three different ways of, of, or method of getting somebody to add pressure on the outside ski. And so when we, uh, I think if you, you know, part of, part of the readings I always give my students, whether, whether they're preparing for a level one or level two or level three is to review the, the um, oh, there, there are, I'm getting to review the skills uh, in the manual, skills references, because those are the tools that we use to build a skier. And whenever we have a method, uh, and, and I think a good teacher will try to take that method and then apply it or relate it to uh, the skills, the skills framework. So that's that's i think very critical to understand 
sometimes teachers forget to make that connection or sometimes there's uh, a language, you know, people's second language. And so a step is missed in that process. And that may lead to your, your lack of understanding. But if um, good learners, good learners tell their coaches how they learn best, right? So uh, many teachers have diff different methods, but if, if you require that technical understanding, the method should connect to the technique so that we understand how that's going to help us improve, whether it's short terms or long terms. But a good learner will always tell their coach, this works best for me, right? So we know that there's, you know, I, I talked about the four levels of learning, but there's also four types of learners in, in essence. There's four basic types of learners and a good teacher will teach to all types. So um, the four types of learners are the watcher, the doer, the thinker, and the feeler. And Lynn's gonna write those down there in, in the chat for us, right? So there's the watcher, the doer, the thinker, and the feeler. And the watcher has to watch, right? They have to watch their, their coach or their teacher do that move, and then they copy it. The doer needs to do it, do it a lot. And they, they, learn, they learn by doing. So it's similar to the watcher, but they got to do it. The thinker is the analytical one. And that's where the thinker usually has a lot of questions. Oh, we've got another talker there, Lynn. Uh, the watcher, um, or sorry, the thinker asks a lot of questions. They want that technical information. And sometimes that bogs, bogs down a, a lesson or it can, can stop us from uh, watching and doing. So that's in contradiction to those, those two types of learners. And that person is, is better dealt with in the, in the classroom or on the chairlift so that the watchers and doers can keep going. The feeler, the feeler has to feel what the new move is. And the, the feeler has to obviously do it um, to understand it uh, and, and feel what it's like. And if you're a teacher, and, and this regardless is if you're a level one instructor, a two instructor, a three instructor, a four instructor, when, when we teach, it's important that we give our students an understanding of what they should feel when they do that next move. And the, the feeler, um, because, because if we use feelings, the student understands when they get the move or not. So there's a yes, I got it, and no, I didn't get it, or I got it 50% of the time, or I got it 80% 80, 80 of the time, or 100% of the time. It's a measurement. Right? And, and uh, like it or not, we all we all watch measurements. We we sometimes watch uh, how many steps I did in a day, how many kilometers did I bike, how many runs did I make, how much money do I have in the bank. We those these are all measurements, right? But so a feeling is a measurement too, and, and we're satisfied uh, knowing when we 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 can measure something and then we're success, successful at it, or we get it more times than we did last time. Another thing I, I believe, and this is from my experience working with a lot of uh, top athletes, top level four, I've, I've trained a lot of the top level four people here in Whistler across Canada. And what I found is uh, nobody is one of those type of learners individually. They are usually a mix of those. But at the end of the day, the best skiers eventually learn to feel what it is like to do something. So they become very sensitive to their bottom, whether it is feeling the shins touch the front of the boots or the calves touch the back of the boots, or they, they feel along the bottom of their feet, they feel the pressure, they feel the ski slide out and they, you know, there's those sensory things. It might be hearing the ski slide out. It might be feeling the, the stutter, the, the, you know, the, the shake of the skis. They get to feel it. But most of us are a combination of all those four, the watcher, the doer, the thinker, and the feeler. And if, if you go back in time, when we were, when we were uh, very little, 
you know, before we were two. And I want to, I'll put a question out there for everybody. How did you learn to walk? Right? Did, did you learn to walk by somebody telling you how to do it? Or did you copy? Right? So did you watch and do? Right? So I think most people watch and did. How did you learn how to speak? Did somebody tell you how to form the words with your lips? No, you watched, you copied, and you tried. And uh, it's when we get a little bit older that we start to become more analytical and the thinker in us starts to come out. And that, that thinker uh, starts to ask a lot of analytical questions and dive in deep to a lot of subject matter. And that sometimes leads to that, uh, the complication of the learning process because we we read into it a lot of these little things and we try to understand it and then we get the confusion and it's okay we need to ask those questions and we need to work through it but but when you're teaching uh you have to watch out for these different types you have to teach to all of these types but as a learner you need to take responsibility for uh coaching your coach on how you learn best. Because if you learn a certain way and your coach isn't teaching that, by uh, you telling your coach, your coach wants to help you. So tell the coach, say, I need you to do this, or I need more of that. And, and your coach goes, oh, okay, great. Now I can really help you, right? So, so take, that, take that step and that will, I think, help the process to get to the simplification and the understanding process of it. Right. And and sometimes when a teacher uses a lot of uh, different methods versus kind of the tried and true technical aspects that you're used to, that can also lead to confusion. And so there there comes the opportunity to say, uh, hey, um, I need to know how this method, you know, what skill is it working on? When is it working on? How is it applied? And how does that make me better? Okay. Um, so that, that's sometimes what can, can lead to uh, some of the confusion out there. Uh, Neil to everyone, I am a thinker. Yes, good that you recognize that. And I think if you're a thinker, can you learn by watching and doing? Can you learn by feeling? Right. Okay. We're we're all of it. I like I like to know what and why we're doing something, because I'm then motivated by the goal of the final outcome. But I'm a I'm a watcher doer. I, I and I don't watch long. I want to get in there and I want to try. Okay. Um. So that's my little talk on on method versus technique. Uh, I think, you know, I mean, it, it's it's short, but I think it's to the point. And my reason for doing that is because I want to help learners learn. And some sometimes uh, lost in lost in, uh, you know, if English is a second language by some of our teachers, uh, sometimes we get caught up in methods or emotion. We forget what the learners needs are. And it's important to kind of connect, but it's also important for the learner to explain, hey, this works for me, and this is what I need. Because at the end of the day, the learner is paying for that lesson, or they are committing their time, which is more important, their time to that learning process, okay? Any, any questions on that little chat? Yeah, so whoever had questions, you can just open your microphone or just type in the chatting room. Sure. Also, I think you, you, you talked about the goal. I think, uh, and I would say, the, how to, what is the goal of skiing and how we can achieve that? So when talking about how, how to achieve that, there might be different techniques uh, applied to different uh, trainer or person. Some of them might work for me, might not. So I feel that, uh, Wow, there, there will be, that is techniques. 
different techniques will help you to achieve the same goal, but there may be some techniques. Diff different methods. Different methods will help you get the same goal. Mm -hmm. Technique is technique is is rooted in science. Mm. So our technique, you know, we we use certain words to describe our technique. But technique is 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 is, is based on the biomechanics of the body, uh, mm. gravity, friction, centripetal force. Um, so th those things are, are, are science-based proven facts. Mm -hmm. It's the method which is the artsy side of teaching, which vary. And those, mm -hmm. are, we have to discern the difference in that because uh, as, as teachers, we use different methods to get our students to learn the, the technical movements, all right? And sometimes those I think are not explained as good as they could be. And it's the learner that needs to say, this works for me, this method works for me, that method doesn't work for me, right? And, and, and identify that. And, and that, that helps the teacher. You know, teachers are mostly pretty good, but not always, because every individual has different needs, right? And no individual, no learner is the same. They're all different. And that's the beauty of teaching. That's what, that's what, like for me, when I teach, I am trying to figure out what makes my student click so that they are successful. And that's my challenge every day when I'm out in front of a group. Does that make sense? Yeah, I also realized that if I, I'm not skiing fast enough, I wouldn't experience those centripetal force. And if I would just want to copy the form of a great skier, that actually make my skiing quite artificial. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I realized that I couldn't train up with you because I'm not fast enough. Hey, Otto. Well, well, sometimes we don't have to ski fast, but that's where, where for me, I find a lot of, um, you know, rhythm and energy. You know, uh, two conversations ago, I talked about how do, how do we want to ski, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that rhythm and that energy, we we don't need to ski fast, but that that repeatable movement that um, if we look at that good skier that appeals to the watcher, uh, that appeals to the doer, and then if it's repeatable and you're doing it a lot, it it, it is great for the the feeler because they feel they can feel the sensations again and again and again and hopefully become mesmer. Uh, memorized and then repeatable and then then the, the thinker hopefully you know i mean we have to have that conversation Th thinkers it's always a verbal generally a verbal conversation to try to get that understanding mm -hmm. uh, i'm curious on my opinion regarding how much theory to teach the student or just watch me and do this how much does it vary depend on the level of the student or the type of learner they are good uh Gee, that's a that's a really good question, you know. Um, and I can only speak from from my experience. It's varied. It it it, it the the amount of theory, you know, and it, it depends on the situation. If I have a somebody that that's you know in the ski school that's paying for a ski improvement lesson, I don't teach them a ton of theory. I teach them a little bit of why, right? So there's um. Adults, adults have a, a need to know why, you know, and it, that's, you know, I say adults, that starts in the age of about 12 to 14 uh, years old. Adults have, the, we call it the need to know. And uh, I've added the why to it, need to know why, because that motivates them into doing something, right? Uh, you know, I want you to vacuum the floor. Why? Uh, because it's dirty, right? I need you to, you know, I need you to clean the, the sink. Well, why? Well, it's it's dirty, you know. So there's, you know, and and why why are we cleaning a dirty sink? Well, because there's germs or there's germs on the floor, so we want to keep the sink clean. So it's the need to know why. And a a, a little side note here: often, as uh, if any of you are parents, you'll understand that sometimes in that 
and this is not always a reason, but in that teenage years, uh, you know, our, our teenage kids often don't like listening to the adults. And what's happened is they've transitioned in that need to know why. They don't do it. They don't want to do it anymore. Um, just because you said so. And up until that point, 10 or 12, we've always told our kids what to do. Just do this and our kids do it. And so we're ingrained to, to, to tell them. But then there's a transition to adulthood and they need to know why. But we don't have the time or the wherewithal to explain the why to them because it's just, it's our nature. But as parents uh, or as adults, there is that need to know why. And if, if, I, have a, if I have a student that's just in a lesson I'll tell them why we're doing something, you know, why we're turning the legs, why we're going over the mogul down the backside and the bumps. This helps us control our speed and then we can make the next turn quickly and we can repeat it going down. And, and that's, then we can get through here successfully. So then they understand, okay, why am I doing that? What's the benefit in it for me? And we all wanna see what that benefit is. So the theory, I, I only discuss theory generally when I'm talking to fellow instructors, because they need to know that, uh, that background of why we turn our legs or why we edge the ski. And so at, at each level, level one through four, there's a different level of theory that comes into play based on the forces in skiing. The faster you go, the greater the forces, the better the understanding needs to be because the timing increases but but theory theory can only be in skiing can only be absorbed at a certain rate so if you stand on the side of the run and talk theory for an hour you're going to put your class to sleep because again we got to think we got watchers and doers sometimes theory is best left in in bite-sized chunks to after so in jasper what we'll what we'll do is we'll you know the various classes will have you know, various moments of talking about theory during the day relative to what the activities are on the hill. But afterwards, we'll we, we can dive into theory a little bit more indoors, um, the use of manuals and, and the understanding of, of skiing, because we're not, we're not, we're not skiing and that's a, that's a better time and we can have videos and we can have uh, the books and the manuals. Hey, I just ordered off the top, I just ordered, uh, for all those that registered early, I, I ordered the next level skier as, as a gift to you guys in Jasper for registering early. So that'll form part of, of what we're going to do there. Uh, they're going to be delivered to me next week. So you'll see them there. Mm. Uh, we'll have chats there. Um, uh, hopefully that answered your question on how much theory we have. And uh, thinkers, no. thinkers like more theory. Yeah, I noticed that Neil said, I'm a thinker and I can learn from feeling and watching a little too. Yeah. 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 We, we all have a little bit in it. You know, I'm more watcher, watcher doer than feeler. And then the thinker part kind of comes along with that. Right. And I'll tell you what, what, uh, kind of more early, you know, when I become a course connector early in my years, students made me think about it more than I did. <laughs> than I typically did. And then I, I really had to think a lot to answer some of the good questions. Well, um, I would say as a trainer, uh, you need to make the change happen. So uh, I think the ultimate goal is actually have the, your student uh, make the change. Have a do something. Somebody else is talking, Lynn. Somebody else is talking. I yeah, know. I just uh, I just mute, mute uh, the, the new joiner. So I would say that uh, yeah, just make the change on the student. You want the change. So the best approach, just like learning a dancing for me, I watch someone skiing. Uh, in a speed or way that I can follow, I just follow. And if I can do it, and I can, if I repeat it, uh, you know, after that, I make the change. But if there's hesitations that I do not know why, uh, you know, we may delve into why, but I would say, 
yeah, knowledge and by watching and copying is the best way of learning. Just like if I'm learning dance, I would like to dance with the trainer and with the mirror, give me the feedback. I don't want someone saying, hey, here's a, here's a theory and here's a physics beneath those theories. I don't need that. But, you know, the, the interesting part is that we do not have the mirror as in the studio with a dancing teacher. And we, if we do not, could not feel ourselves, we need to talk more of that. So I would say maybe just, you know, videotape and timely feedback uh, um, from the trainer is definitely the best way. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And that I, that's how I try to teach. And I think most good trainers try to teach that way. Although sometimes we get caught up in uh, giving our students too much because we want to make sure they're getting good value. If you think about it and you think how complex the, the human brain is, and then you think how complex our body is and the fact that, you know, we can turn our leg and then you can, you're, you know, we, we have this brain that's thinking about balance and the hip can go in and you can fore and aft and you can move up and down. But the motor movements that are required to do these, you know, things are uh, to, to turn your legs, right? Or how you, how you move in and tip the skis on edge. It's super complex. And we don't think about it. We, we kind of just try to watch and copy. And you know, even, even the, the simple things about taking a step is a really complex uh, move. The, the amount of muscles that are involved and the communication from the electrical pathways from your brain down to your, your legs. Uh, so if, if you think about it in that context, learners, it's, it's hard to learn two things at one time, two physical things at one time. If, if you're making one new move, if you're trying to refine turning your legs, you're trying to refine balance or the crossover move, you know, should I add a pole plant in? Should I say, hey, turn the shoulder, so turn the hips one way and then lift your arm? It, it becomes almost too much. And then, and then it really becomes confusing, right? So it, it's keeping it simple and then helping the student progress like that in, in bite-sized chunks. And then we've got, we've got roots and snow conditions. Well, so another question from June. Uh, the question is about June. Uh, for advanced parallel, the hip more close to the ground, the better performance. Is that right? That's a simple statement. That is a simple statement. And generally, it's correct. In general, it's correct if it's done in the right way. Right? But, you know, yeah in advanced parallel, I would say more an expert parallel, you're going to get the hip closer, you're going to edge with the hip for sure. That's, that's generally the idea. Right. And uh, June, if you were with us last week, I think I showed some video of uh, Valentina, and we can see that she gets her hip relatively close to the snow. So in, in theory, yes, it's correct. Oh, and geez, G said uh, so more of why we are doing this rather than the bare theory excellent thanks absolutely correct uh nikita i have a question at what point would you suggest students do some of off slope work for example strength training cross training if you see the progress stagnate um that that's uh <laughs> you, you know that's that's a hard question to answer. I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, multiple sport athletes. So when our children, uh, when we have children in the young, the many parents believe, oh, they want to have a have their ski, you know, their young child ski, 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 ski all the way there, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and ski, 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 ski. You know, um, what happens in actual fact is they burn out on ski. It's better if that if they ski and if they skate and if they play soccer. Um, you know, and they, they run and they play frisbee and they're outside and they play tennis and they do all sorts of things. The same works true for adults and for us. You know, people say, 
you know, uh, you do specific workouts for skiing in the summer? Yes and no. Uh, what I do is I do what's fun in the summer. I do summer things. I, I, you know, I ride my road bike, gravel bike. I go for runs sometimes. Uh, I, I like to play squash. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll go and hit a golf ball. The, the more things you do, and especially if this physical activity is fun, it's, it's generally a lot more motivating and less, less painful. I think for skiing, you need a certain amount of uh, physicality. So you, you need a certain amount of, of uh, strength. And, and strength training isn't the be and end all of it. If you do a lot of other sports, you'll gain enough strength. Um, but, you know, you say cross training. I, I, I believe things like that include a lot of lab, lateral move, movement, like um, your pickle, pickleball is uh, pretty good these days. Tennis or squash or badminton are excellent sports where the, your feet are on the ground and, you, and you're moving laterally fore and aft. Uh, there's hand-eye coordination. You know, uh, you know, other things, whether it's hiking or rock climbing or, um, you know, things that are, are active, I think are, are great cross training uh, exercises for sure. I, I tell people, I tell people, hey, you know, uh, you should juggle, right? Um, yeah, disappear. Because I, I, I have juggling balls, right? And uh, I, I learned to juggle. And it's um, it, it's it's not related to skiing, but it's hand-eye coordination. It, it's it's a, it's very complex keeping track of those balls, and then and it just kind of the movement, uh, um, you know. And I was always fascinated by people who could juggle, and then uh, I bought some juggling balls in a book, and, and in a matter of weeks, I learned how to do it, and I've never forgotten. And every now and then, I picked them up, but you know. Cross training and, and, and anything physical activity, I think, is, is hugely, hugely beneficial. You know, a dance, I think dance would be um, an amazing. Uh, I'm not a good dancer, but, uh, you know, if any formalized dance, which, which is, is very quick. Anything that is, you know, not strength training is one, but agility training is better. Cross training, you know, uh, where, you, where you're moving your, your feet quickly under your basis for it is an excellent skill. Roller skating, yes, that's a roller skating, cross country skiing, um, all those things are phenomenal. Roller skating is really good. You can go down a hill on your roller skates, go down a slight hill, plant them, and then and then you can turn them like a set of skis, right? And they're shorter, so you have to be balanced in the middle. It's phenomenal. Hey, uh, it's getting late. And I'm getting off course. Should I, should I just pop up a couple of these videos and see what I can do? Yeah, I uh, do have access, right? Yeah, time for video analysis. <laughs> let me let me just do a let's see if I can get them up here again. And uh, I'm always bad at this kind of stuff. Okay. You can't be excellent in all areas. <laughs> yeah, this, I'm, not, I'm not excellent in this area here. Uh, here we go. Can you see this screen? Yes, I can. Okay. And here we go. We have a bump skier. Okay. And uh, you know, in bumps, these 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 look like really hard bumps. Can you hear that? Can you still hear me? Uh, we can hear you. We can see the bumps. Okay, great. Yeah. Now, um, good bump skiing down the fall line, down the fall line, bump after bump. These are really hard and that means we've got to turn a lot and we've got to let it, got to let it get a little edge grip on them. 
Okay. Now, if I uh, if if I do my typical drawing here, what are we going to see here? We're going to see a couple of things. We're going to see this leg straight here, but we see this leg like that, and then I see. Uh, tips quite a far, far apart. So the outside leg is behind the inside leg. And that means that there's a lot of shim pressure. And, and then the leg, uh, the ankle is bent and the hips are forward. So, so the leg can't bend and absorb the pressure. And in the bumps at the end of the turn, you wanna absorb a bit of the pressure and then let the legs go over the side. So the feet need to be side by side and the weight has to be in the middle of, middle of the arch a little bit, okay? Okay, so let's go here. You know the root. The root is fine, and and for me, if we, what happens sometimes is if you look at uh, right. See if I can get it back. You know, the root over the bump here is nice. Okay, the root is nice here. Feet. See now the, the feet are a little closer together here and there's a little bit better bending. Okay, the outside foot is still behind. I still see a bit of, of daylight between the legs. All right, the feet come together here better. And I can see, oh, see the bending now occurs. And then the center of mass rises up over. This is better, the hands are forward here. A little bit late as I can see that the, the ski tip took a little bit time to get down on the inside one here, right? Now this is, this is, here bending again and then coming up. All right. Now what's going to happen here is we're going to get a little bit. See that outside leg gets a little bit back. I know the inside leg is high on the side of the bump, but um, as a result, the the body and shoulder are forward on the skis and the ski slide out. It's hard to get the hip in to get some edging. Okay, they come back together here, but it's a little bit late. And again, here you can see it it good, but if it's late, the skis go in different ways and I'm not pressing down soon enough on the bump. Just, just a month, right here. Now you can really see that outside leg behind and you can see its knees pressed forward and the inside leg is a little straighter. Then what happens is the legs, you know, a bit forward and we don't turn uh, with the lower body as much as we can. There's a bit of a, a, a turn in the spine and the upper back. Okay, I'm being picky. That's what that's what you're paying me for, right? Okay. Do you think he's a level three standard, or how do you see? Yeah, you know, on on video, it's really hard to tell um, on how steep those bumps are. I mean, if mm -hmm. he's skiing that and that's a black run, then yes. But if if it's a if it's like a, a you know a, a green run or a very light blue run, then then it might be a bit harder to tell you know it has to I have to understand how steep it is but certainly it's you know the snow is very firm and icy okay so here uh, okay now a lot of things come up and if we want what we want to see is we want to see an active lower body turning separately than the upper body, right? The upper body should be facing uh, where you're going, not where you're gonna go. But here, if I look at the outside arm, so here the left arm, and I can see the left arm and shoulder pulling and tipping in, and it looks like everything's all all together. I don't, I don't see an active uh, upper and lower body separation. And I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna show you something in here.
So if you look at the end of the turn, it becomes quite obvious. So right here, I can start to see that gap. I can see the, uh, the triangle between the lower leg. So the outside foot is behind the inside leg. And when that, uh, that that's a you know, very clear sign of being too far forward on the outside ski. So that outside ski really is the controlling ski in, in the turn. So in this case, it's uh, the right, right leg when we're moving to the left or the left leg when we're going to the right. And as a result, I can see as this turn progresses, you're going to see the outside hand and shoulders kind of come around and across. And really, they should be facing a little, not straight down the hill, but they should be facing where we're going to go, not across the hill. And here, here you can see the, the tib fibs aren't parallel. So what I would do is I would ask the skier, hey, can you feel uh, the calves touch very lightly against the back of the boot at the end of the turn? Uh, the action to do that might be pushing that outside ski ahead just a little bit or pulling the inside one back. And it might be taking the inside hand and, and crossing it over so that I'm facing kind of to the middle of my next turn, right? So you can watch it here in normal speed, see the little gap on both sides. And then I see the tail of the ski travel a further distance than the front of the ski, kind of slides out at the end of the turn right here. See how the hand comes across the body on the end of the turn from down the hill? So the upper body is leading that turning effort versus the lower body. And that's a result of the pressure being too far forward on the skis. And we don't see, because the pressure is too far forward, um, and the ankle is locked, we don't see a change in leg length, right? So that's, you know, changing leg length would help that. And here we're gonna see the bumps again. All right, here we go. Hard to tell how steep this is for level three, but I don't see the legs, you know, bending and moving and, and flowing. The root is fine, but if I go, if I go back to the, the stance in the legs, the common problem, whether it's groomed or, or not groomed in here, I can watch this. I'm just gonna draw right here. Here we go, draw, arrow. Pretty big gap, isn't it? So that outside ski, is considerably behind, right? And then, and then uh, what it does is, it, you know, we're still facing where we're gonna go, but it, it's hard. I've gotta start turning my upper body to, to make that work. And then, and then yeah, this, this, if you look at the turns, there's kind of a pause sometimes at the end of every turn, pause because the feet stop, the feet don't go and move all the way through. Okay, let's see if I can find, I have another skier here. Um, Daniel, juggling comment. Mobile skiing has arrived. Um, bear with me one sec. Uh, mm -hmm. There's one other skier that was looking for yeah. some comments, and I just need to find it. It's on a. So while you're checking, I saw Daniel Xia send a link uh, to the group. Just curious what that link uh, is. You may want to explain something. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't want to, you know, click those links and uh, yeah. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just, just for fun because like uh, um, Otto was mentioning about uh, juggling and it's just a combination of juggling and uh, skiing, mogul skiing. So it's a funny video. Oh, no, I don't do juggling, but I saw people like juggling and uh, skiing mogul sometimes. I mean, I saw the video before and that's why. Um, but I do have a, one question to uh, Otto. Uh, you just mentioned about like uh, um, moving the outward hand inwards during the turn. Um, but I saw a lot of good uh, like uh, top level skier like when they carving, they have this. They tend to have this uh, this motion with the hands going dropping on the inside. So the outward um, our hand move. Uh, I mean the outside hand moving in for uh, inward during the. Uh, the turn right. like uh daniel were you, were you were you with me last week when we watched valentina uh no, no. okay so uh valentina frankhauser she's on uh, instagram and uh, a lot of if you watch her yes her inside hand drops and her outside hands up she moves them around a lot but they're disconnected at the shoulder that means that the arm like if you watch my arm if there my arm and my shoulder my arm is pulling my shoulder and twisting my upper body. Well, she was doing this, okay? So the mm -hmm. arms were moving, but it wasn't affecting the upper body. And that's the problem is, is um, uh, with a lot of skiers is the arms affect the upper body. And, and then when the upper body starts leading the turning effort, that's not the way we want to ski. The way we want to ski is with the lower body leading the turning effort. When you're driving a car, uh, the wheels turn first and then the body goes along. The body of the car doesn't lead the wheels, right? right. And that same, same, same applies to us. But most often the arms are doing that because we're too far forward on the feet. The arms, the arms are um, generally not the problem, but they can be part of the solution. Uh, you know, when, when a good skier does it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's right. There's that, that in, in the case of Valentina, there's a subtlety there that her arms are not affecting her, where her upper body is. Her upper body is facing where she's going, not where she's going to go. But in that last gear, I showed you the arms and it's the, the arms are not the problem, but they can be part of a solution. So in, instead of Instead of being lazy with my hands and dropping my inside hand and letting my body turn, if I keep my inside hand up and my outside hand facing the direction of travel, I can then maybe focus on letting my lower body, my legs turn to lead me where I want to go. And that will help me uh, stay better balanced so I can control pressure, so I can turn the legs, so I can let the hip, hip edge. So those are a number of things there. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, I am going to try to get one more video up here. Uh, see if I can do that. Here we go. Can you see this video screen now? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is exactly, Daniel, what we were talking about a little bit here, okay? So uh, this skier, right? Okay, so it, it's not as bad, but you see that inside hand drop right down, right? In any, in any sport we do, like if you watch tennis, right? If, if I'm hitting a tennis ball, I don't drop my hand here. I have that hand out for balance, okay? If, I, if, I, if I'm um, a gymnast and I wanna spin, I have my hands in tight to my body and I can spin. But if I'm here, that helps with the stability of my upper body, not only to stop it from, from spinning, right? But it helps it left and right, right? And with my arms out, it helps the center of mass lower and be stability. One, one thing with the hands moving, Sometimes I know as a skier, it helps with rhythm, but rhythm should be from the lower body, not necessarily the upper body, right? And now with this skier here, you know, the hand moves and the shoulders move slightly, 
I'm just trying to get the draw here again. So we, we look here and we see, you know, I'm going to point to the skis. So I've got a lot of lead change, right? So I've got the back, the back of the foot here, the back of the foot here, right? And so that um, even though we see this hip, hip is, is low, uh, it's turning. And if I look in the outside ski, I've got weight forward on the outside ski a little bit, okay? And when, we, when this happens, if I get inside like that, see how the upper body starts to move first and it kind of comes up, right? And that, that, that is a long, uh, our transition ends up being longer. Okay, we've only got 11 seconds here, but so here the transition ends up long and we can see that the upper body is starting to lead with some of that rhythm versus just the lower body. And once I, once I lead with that upper body, then, then uh, the transition is long, right? And then it's kind of versus just the smoothness of the lower body. So here I would just try to, again, change the balance subtly to allow the lower body to, to bend and let the, the legs to go under the center of mass so we have that smooth transition. Okay. It seems like a happy dancing. <laughs> he does so yeah. happy. Yeah. The, the, you know, I mean, it's not, it's, it's still good skiing. It, it is, it's, it, you know, um, accomplished skier. But that's sometimes the difference between a, a rhythm where I have the body doing this versus I get my arms to, to, to sway. And, and when we're dancing, the arms can sway. But really in skiing, that, that is part of the stability, particularly when we get into short turns and moguls you know, and, and steeper short turns on bumps. Uh, we really want that upper body to be quiet because if I, if I get that body, that's um, it's a lot of mass, it's a lot of weight above our legs. If I get it moving in one direction, it's hard to get it to go back again. It takes a while. So if I get it to fall in, then, and it keeps going in and it's twisting and moving in, the, in that direction, it's hard for it to come over and go the other way. But if I can get it slowly to go down like this, and then I'm just kind of catching it smoothly as I go. Uh, that makes for more efficient skiing. And that's a, that's a subtlety between, you know, this is an expert skier carving well, between an, an expert skier and an elite skier. And, and it's small, right? It's small, but it's still, a, it's still thousands of hours to try to get there. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting uh, question talking about uh, the feet. You mentioned about side by side, and you talk about if those two feet are too far apart, that creates mm -hmm. a gap in between the two skis. So uh, I noticed that there are some CSIA trainers, they, especially with research background. It seems that they really enjoy a certain degree of gaps. Or, am, am I right? Yeah, you know. Yeah, and so you know you've got uh, even even level four trainers. Mm. Uh, there's a there's a varying degree of ability and expertise among them. You know, once you're, you know, it's a standard, and then if you become a level two course conductor, that's a little higher standard, and a level three course conductor is a little higher standard, a level four course conductor is a little, a little higher standard, and and we can, we can we can be picky. There's a bit of a misnomer where oh, I want to press hard on the front of the boots all the time. Well, that puts you forward. You know, part of what I'm going to talk about on the camp um, with everybody is how to do their boots up properly so that you can get the most out of them. Because most people, you know, and even shops don't know how to, how to do the boots up that they're given so that they caress the lower leg properly. And we'll spend a bit of time on that. Um, it'll, feel, it'll feel different for, for sure at first. I know... Uh, as Zhao Li was with me last week and uh, I, I talked to her and I think it was a bit of an eye opener. It's like, whoa, okay, that's, that's a bit different. I have, I have a lot of control now. Um, so we're gonna, spend, we're gonna spend a bit of time with that. But if you want to, uh, you know, if, you're, if you can stand up now, um, just take, just here's, here's a, little, uh, here's a little, little fun thing to try. Um, stand up, 
and then um, put one foot in front of the other one. So, you know, put, put them in and have a, have about that much space in between them, which is about what we saw. So from the, from your toe to the heel, there's uh, 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 10 or 15 centimeters. Okay. So, and then keep them flat on the floor. Now, now don't move your feet and try to bend. Try to bend down. How does that feel? Can you, where do you bend? You bend in the lower, are your feet, are your heels staying on the ground, right? Can you bend, right? All of a sudden, your back leg, the calf starts to stretch, right? And so, it, so it's kind of awkward. Now, take your feet and put them side by side, right? Keep them flat on the ground and now bend down, right? Now it's easier. You're using both of your legs, but they work, your, your legs work in parallel. They don't, they don't work when they're not in parallel. They actually inhibit one another. And so that's, that's what the skier is trying to do is, is to, to bend with one foot in front of the other when, when we're made to be like this. And if you think of most sports, when we move, our feet are more or less side by side. Okay. So that's, that's my, my uh, <laughs> moment of truth for the moment of truth for the evening is to try something. That's for, that's for the watchers and the doers. Yeah. Okay, the doers you get you get get out of your seat and do something um so that's it that's all i have for tonight is there any any other questions go and look at that mogul skiing with juggling i'm going to look at that i want to okay okay um any questions anybody want to pop any more questions in the chat before we uh say good night uh, I, anybody... do have a, I have a question. Yes. So ahead. would you say um, the body position changes depends on the style of skiing, like, uh, you know, zipline moguls versus like, a, you know, racer carving? You know, because like say, um, you know, when, when we talk when we talk with uh, racer, a lot of them talk about like uh, um, cross under, um, like they're I feel like their their center of mass is back um, compared to uh, you know normal basically parallel skier. Um, so and and also for you know deep line moguls, um, people tend to have their upper body up straight. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's slight variation, but in all in all cases, you know, you can you can say that the base of support crosses under the center of mass or the center of mass crosses over the base of support. It just just depends on perspective. Some people say cross middle. So there's a middle point and the center of mass goes over the top and the base of support goes underneath, right? Uh, whatever happens. But it's that, Daniel, it's an athletic position that's required uh, with, with a certain amount of, of flexibility with the, the pressure that comes on hard in a zipper line mogul. Um, if your if your back is rounded, then you're going to bob forward a little bit. So the spine tends to to be a little bit uh, a little bit straighter. Whereas generally in World Cup skiing, whether it's slalom or GS, the the body can be a little bit rounded, and then the pressure is um, absorbed. You know the the legs bend and let the mass go across. But you know all the skills are the same. You know, but it's a different blend of the skills. It's a different blend of, of pressuring the skis fore and aft. And when you do that based on uh, the environmental condition, the shape of the turn, the pressure, uh, but we're all, but we're controlling the pressure. We're controlling the pressure fore and aft vertically and left and right ski. We're also turning the legs. So in, 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 uh, in a slalom, beginning of a slalom turn, you're turning the ski a lot versus compared to GS turn, but in, a mogul zipper line mogul you're turning the skis a lot and then edging you know in a in the back half of a slalom turn or gs turn there's a lot of edging where in slalom there's edging but we're letting it go to slide because the mogul skier wants more speed okay but it's still athletic position and you look you know the hands are here and, and the base of support is moving underneath from side to side um, 
And also, uh, when I look at uh, the racer, when they skiing, they also have like a lot of uh, up body movements. Like they feel like say, their their hands are helping them making turns. So when when you when you look at uh, these skiers, when you look at World Cup skiers in a World Cup slalom course or GS course, uh, you know, slalom course they're moving their hands because they've got to hit the gate. Um, but they are fighting for balance. In a perfect world, their hands would stay out front, but we have to remember these courses are set to challenge these athletes at the very highest level. So they are not skiing perfectly in those situations. They're trying to, but they, they are pushed to the maximum. And that's, that's the courses are done that so that the top skier comes out on top. The one that can fight through those, um, balance challenges and turning challenges and that's why hand, the hands are moving and the skis are you know they, they're slightly off you know they're, they're too far forward and the skis slide out and their hands drop in so so it's it's not perfect you'll get you'll get a, a, a maybe a, a perfect turn or two here or there you know the the mogul skiers their environment is a little bit more controlled uh, and and they rely more on the stability of the upper body and the pole plant. Right? The pole plant is very critical for them so that the, the body doesn't twist and turn, right? Because if the, in a mogul skiing, if, if they don't plant it, the body's going to continue to turn. They need to stabilize it and keep it going forward. So you'll, you're going to see their body um, and, and hands more kind of in a, in a set position because they don't, if it goes off, they are usually in trouble. Like if they miss that pole plant or if their body their hand drops, they're usually in trouble and then, and then either fall or their legs come apart and, and that's a miss for them. Okay. Uh, hey, um, a couple of other things, just uh, happy to have everybody join us here. If you haven't made up your mind whether you're gonna come to Jasper or not, we have a couple of spots left in both the first and second camps. Uh, if you want to do the whole thing, you can still, still do that. But if you're looking at doing either the first camp or the second camp, uh, we do have, um, there's a TD course in between the two camps on the 9th and 10th, and there's a level three exam on the 16th and 17th. And so if you're, if you're looking to, to do that, uh, jump in, we've got two or three spots. Daniel, you're more than welcome uh, for an, you know, the answer to your questions. Good, good. They're tough questions. They made me think about it. Um, anything, anything else? Take, take one more before we go. Daniel is a thinker. <laughs> He's a thinker. Yeah, yeah, good. But in the first video, we saw the skier was pivoting the ski on top of the moguls and slide, slipping down the backside of the moguls, resulting in poor turn shapes with the tail swinging around the tips instead of the tail following the tips. Is this a concern for level three or is it not? The, the tail was sliding more than the tip, and that's because the weight was too far forward, right? Generally, you're going to um, make a, a more of a drifted type of turn or a skidded type of turn down the backside and bumps to manage speed, especially when it's icy. Uh, yes, it's a concern. Um, you know, depending upon how steep that was, again, that uh, relates to the degree of difficulty. The steeper it is in that situation, if that was, you know, Cat Skinner, you know, if that was a, a really steep black run at Worcester Blackcomb, that might be okay. But if that is bumps like under the Emerald Chair, then that that uh, ability needs to, you know, we need to improve that skier to get to the standard of the level three. Also, I have a question. I um, some people when I when I uh, like uh, carving and uh, do the mogul skiing, some people told me I need to uh, increase my edge angle. Do you know how should I improve on that? Make, make sure make sure you turn your skis first. Create a steering angle, then move the hip in. And come to Jasper and tree if it's but, awesome. <laughs> but Danielle, it's hard for me to it's hard for me to tell you without actually seeing the ski. <laughs> okay. Now, that person talking to you, was it a friend of yours or was somebody actually qualified to teach? Um, they're they're uh, all ski instructors. Yeah, are they, uh, how, yeah. how qualified are they? 
not to determine, um, not to determine how much you believe in what they should say. <laughs> okay, they're <laughs> level two PSIA instructors. Yeah, they're they're good for teaching, you know, up to a basic intermediate, but at the higher higher level, I'm they probably don't have a lot of experience there. So I'm not sure I would um, I would take what they say with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. But we would love to have you, and I would be happy to uh, help you out if you come if you come to the camp. We're gonna we're gonna work on carving. We're gonna work on bumps, steeps, all sorts of uh, stuff. We're improve our gates, teaching. And the gates Pardon? and brushes. Gates and brushes, right? Gates and brushes. Yes, we're gonna have a, a course set up for sure. Mm, that's exciting. Lots of mileage. Yeah. Yeah, and we're gonna have we're gonna have uh, video video analysis so that uh, you know on hill and afterwards we can look at your skiing and develop you um, and answer uh, answer kind of questions. Yeah, I'm actually located in uh, in Chicago, um, so I, I passed the level two PSIA, but I mean I I just joined like this group, so I don't, I'm not sure about you know the course information, so I don't I don't really have any. Um, I don't know where I can have those informations. Uh, Daniel, are you, you in the HPC group? Just add me WeChat, I'll send you the information. I just sent you my WeChat info here. Or you can just add auto, skip his auto. It's his WeChat. Daniel, did you see our WeChat uh, ID? Okay, the... yes, I'll, I'll add you. Yep, thank you so uh, much. Jen Danielle, here's uh, I posted my uh, email address in the chat there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that's you know if you want to package uh, for me, uh, it's hard for me to put put the, put the package information on WeChat. I'm not as good as other people on WeChat. I'm pretty good, but not super good. But I can email you that. I've got a whole package of it. Um, but a lot of that information I know has been posted on uh, high performance camp group that Lynn was talking about. Sounds so good. a couple ways, couple ways to get that information. Okay. Glad you joined us tonight. Yep. So then I just put information. If you are PSIA, I think uh, all the credit can be transferred into CSIA, right? It's uh, there's a enroll process and uh, so that you can consider CSIA level three. Well, yeah. Yeah, if you want to take CSI level three. Um, for the camp, uh, no problem. We're happy happy to have have you. You fit you fit right in with uh, with the group we've got going there. Jasper's a great place. It's in the Rockies. It's kind of a medium sized ski resort, but not not too busy. So we're going to have kind of the run of the place when we're there. The snow will be really good. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for your time tonight been another awesome week. Lynn, thank you for organizing uh, this session and being a great host that you are. And everybody, thank you for, for showing up and asking some great questions and listening to us once again. And we hope to see you in Jasper shortly. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Bye. So I will Bye. stay online for a couple of minutes in case any logistic questions, I can hear to answer some questions. Okay, yeah, so thank, thank you so much, Otto. Thank you. And feel free to email me if you've got any questions too. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye, Otto. 对,大家就是要注意一下,一个是Nikita 4月9号到10号,那个TD Training已经可以在CSA网站上去报名了,所以你可以去。然后Otto说呢,他会再确认一下,如果说 在三月底或者四月初考过三级拿聘的人，可不可以enroll TD training？ 他觉得呢，应该是可以先做 enrollment。如果没有拿到聘，可以取消。但是我怀疑啊，因为如果你没有这个聘的话，有可能你都没有办法做 enrollment。这边等他确认。另外呢，就是四月八九十三天有一个 level three training， 呃 ski training， 然后呢？ 4月16、17有一个Level 3的这个exam 那么现在是三缺一的情况 就是到了四个我们就可以申请提前两周就可以
make it happen， 所以大家还可以去把这个消息。嗯，跟大家散播一下，我们就差一个人了，应该也或者有犹豫的哈，可能也要看一下时间了。还有就是订房的信息，呃，二十六号是这优惠的截止日期，那大家呢也要及早跟这个找到你的这个，如果要 share room 哈，那进群有一个叫做拼车拼房群，然后的话呢，那个也是尽尽早要去订了，要 confirm 了，需要自己订，不是这个澳洲统一帮忙订的哈。因为这里面他已经拿下折扣了，只要大家去报名就好了。有人问到这个缆车，呃，就是怎么买雪机票，呃，在第一天去窗口买就好了，然后跟他报 auto 培训营 ，auto 会把我们的名单交给他们就好了。对，主要是这些问题。嗯，那大家还有什么想问的？想问的谁去开麦就就就聊了。哦，你去看你去看你问吃什么是吧？嗯，我最近在想，就带些什么海底捞小龙坎的这个调料过去，番茄锅、麻辣锅，在涮起来多好呀。然后那个有个朋友建议我说去那个去 Canadian Tires 买一个片肉片的机器，这样的话走到哪都可以涮火锅。哎呀，我想想还是觉得挺兴奋的。嗯，对。还有什么？大家还有什么问题、想法？都可以他那个酒店房间里面允允许涮火锅吗？会不会很味道太大？只要你不嫌弃，我不嫌弃，我我不管其他人了。嗯 ，OK。滑雪配火锅，那肯定是最合适的。对对对，就告诉我说，我我最近打听到去哪里可以买那个片肉的东西，电电动的，然后呢就从店里买出生肉来直接片。哎呀，想想就很幸福。再煮点什么豆腐啊、蘑菇啊、青菜，对吧？嗯，好呀，那大家还有什么问题啊，或者想聊的呀什么的？嗯，我们家把人录制给它关了，听着录制。